Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. I am Gordon Hansen. I am the Acting Dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy and also the Director of the Center on, on Global Transformation. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, you here uh, for the second uh, in a series, the Global Forum series that the School of Global Policy and Strategy is organizing with the San Diego World Trade Center. Um, and it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, this afternoon Dr. Enrico Letta, who is the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po, uh, as well as uh, having been the 55th Prime Minister of Italy from 2013 uh, to 2014. Uh, he is here to address the future of the European Union and the challenges that the EU faces now, in particular with the recent Brexit vote uh, and uh, direct threats to the very existence of the European Integration Project, as well as the challenges created by the ongoing migration pro uh, uh, crisis on the continent. Uh, Dr. Letta is here as a Pacific Leadership Fellow at the Center on Global Transformation. Uh, the Fellows Program and the Center uh, exist thanks to the generous support of Irwin and Joan Jacobs. So this decade, uh, and uh, pretty much following the, uh, uh, the global financial crisis, uh, the EU has faced a series of, of crises uh, that threaten its very existence. This began with the European debt crisis in 2010, uh, it continued with the migration crisis precipitated by the Syrian uh, civil war uh, and the, the tumult created by the Arab Spring, uh, continued with the Brexit vote last summer, uh, and now uh, continues with uh, threats to European integration created by the rise of nationalist politicians uh, in France, in the Netherlands, in Austria, in Italy, in Greece, in Hungary, uh, in Poland, uh, so that the, the question of whether globalization should be part of Europeans, uh, uh, Europe's uh, future uh, is very much at the, at the front of global debate, uh, of public debate, as it is here in the United States. Uh, and we could not have a more uh, knowledgeable guide through these troubled waters. Uh, after finishing his PhD in European Union law, uh, Dr. Letta spent a 25-year career in Italian politics. Uh, he began um, as the youngest ever uh, Minister of EU Affairs, also served as a Minister of Industry, uh, served in the Italian par Parliament uh, and in the EU Parliament, and as a Secretary to the Council of, of Ministers. So after that uh, 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 career in politics, he's now prepared for the real political uh, conflict that exists in the academic world uh, in his return uh, uh, to scholarly life. Um, uh, in his new role as Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs, uh, he is uh, continuing his lifelong commitment to the project of European uh, integration. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Enrico Letta. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you all for being here and Thank you for the invitation, first of all. I'm so glad to be here. It's a great opportunity for me, first of all, because the room is full, so I can tell to my fellow colleagues in uh, uh, Europe that Europe is not considered as dead or archaeology, but is interesting. And uh, in San Diego, there's a great interest on Europe. I'm so happy of that because of that. Uh, thank you, Gordon, for your introduction, very kind introduction. I, in, in reality, you mentioned many crises, and you're right. Europe is a sequence of crises in this very period. And I tell to my French friends, because I, now I, I lead a French university institution, and, and I said to them always, you, the French, you're not used to live with crises. This is why you asked an Italian to be in France. <laughs> because we are the world leaders of crisis, so <laughs> I'll try to give you some very brief and very short overviews, and then we, we, we can talk together, we can share uh, this discussion about the future of Europe, uh, starting with these two points, the, the Brexit first and the migration crisis, and uh, with a conclusion, the conclusion will be on this 2017 year, that is a very crucial year. I will uh, end up my uh, introductory remarks by saying that this 17 is a sort of Europe sliding doors. We can exit um, one way and we can exit another completely different way. 
of course, I hope that the exit will be uh, the, the, the right one for a more integrated Europe, but uh, starting with the French elections, the discussion among the future of Europe will be really decisive. But let me start by saying a few words on, on the two main crises that uh, we are facing now. So Brexit first, and then the migration crisis. Start by Brexit. Uh, my proposal here is on the, first of all, the map. The map, uh, I, I think I imagine you are familiar with, but the map of the vote uh, on Brexit is, I think, very interesting. Because it's a way, first of all, for, for many reasons, Brexit uh, was interesting for, first of all, because of the uh, unprecedented situation. We enlarged Europe. We had the tools to work with the enlargement. We didn't have any tools to work with uh, uh, an European Union losing members. So this is one of the reasons of the main difficulty today, how to have a toolbox, effective toolbox, uh, to uh, have one member leaving the European Union. But what is interesting here, I think, to have an interpretation, a political interpretation of the vote, is the way in which um, it is very complicated and very difficult to uh, have keys in traditional ways, left, right, uh, social classes. At the end of the day, the only key here to understand in England, I mentioned this point because as you can easily see, I, Northern Ireland, Scotland are two different stories. But here in England, the true cleavage was between, I would say, close and openness, cities and countryside. You can easily see here the blue, the blue is the remain, and the red, Brexit. And the big difference is the fact that in all the big cities, even in England, uh, the remain won, and all the countryside in England, Brexit won. The second main point and important issue is linked to the uh, age vote. Youth was strongly in favor of remain, strongly in favor. Age society was strongly in favor of Brexit. But the two part of the society had a different turnout, a different approach to the vote. The aged part of the society voted at 80, 85 percent. Youth didn't vote. And that was the big difference. I remember in uh, Paris, in our university, we have a lot of uh, British students discussing with them. They were crying the day after because of uh, the result. And they were crying, first of all, because they didn't vote. They didn't think that the vote was a decisive moment without the possibility to have a sort of, uh, you know, when, when uh, on the internet you follow somebody, you can defollow somebody. But the, vo the vote is not a like, it's not a, a follow, you can defollow. The vote is a vote, and when it's done, it's done. And exactly this second point is interesting to understand what happened, uh, the differences, and also the fact that cities and youth pro-remain. Countryside, age society, pro-Brexit. That is, I think, interesting, because you can try to understand a little bit the ideas for the future. Uh, you know that the, the main slogan of the Brexiters was take back control, take back control. I think you heard something like that here, too. But you, you, you don't have a Brussels here. Uh, they had Brussels. This is very interesting, I think. I had always a sort of comparison, a similarity between the US elections. And some slogans in the US elections, take back control, 
is one of them. That take back control for the Brexiters was easy to say because it was to take back control from Brussels. But here you had, in some sense, a similar slogan without, I repeat, any Brussels. So it is the demonstration, this is what I think, that the problem was Europe, yes, but the problem is, first of all, the problem of losing sovereignty in the globalization period. This is what exactly we discussed today with uh, uh, Dean Hansen about uh, the consequences of globalization in terms of uh, fears of the people and losing control, losing sovereignty is a, is a great deal, is one of the greatest deal today. But coming back to Brexit, what are the consequences now? First consequence and first point is this polarization here, Northern Ireland and Scotland. These two subjects are so huge, so difficult to, to deal with. Uh, two different subjects. Scotland, because Scotland uh, wants and wanted to stay and to, to stay in the European Union uh, with, with a large majority of, uh, of remains. Ireland, because for Ireland the problem is, is that uh, the European Union was part of the peace process to close the period of Sunday Bloody Sunday. And uh, the border there will be raised again. This is the key point. Because the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, it doesn't exist today because the UK is in the European Union, but this border will be raised again. And that will be one of the key problems of Brexit negotiations and the internal discussion in the UK on the topic. I think uh, Prime Minister May is starting uh, very complicated negotiation with Scotland on the one hand, but with Ireland on the other hand. And the two subjects will have a two different timing. Northern Ireland will be, the, will be first, uh, because the discussion about negotiations with the European Union on how to get out and the negotiation with the Republic of Ireland will immediately bring and have the point about the border there. The discussion with Scotland will be second uh, because of the referendum and the procedures to have a referendum in Scotland that is a little bit uh, longer than uh, the discussion on Ireland and on the Ireland, on the Irish border. The discussion on Brexit is uh, also linked to the uh, timing. You know the Lisbon Treaty uh, of the European Union uh, gives two years for the negotiation for, uh, to, to get out. Two years is a very short period. It's a very short period because two years means uh, all the process with the ratification of the outcome of the negotiation. So the true timing for the activity of negotiating the way to get out will be no more than 15 months. And 15 months for a negotiation around the topic that is 40 years living together. And 40 year, years living together means millions and millions of uh, article amendments, uh, laws. It will be very complicated. There's a dimension of the problem that is until now, I think, under-evaluated. It would be very complicated technically. There's another important topic that is the unbalance between the UK and the European Union in terms of political approach to the negotiation. The negotiation started. The European Union appointed one chief negotiator. is a French, Michel Barnier. He was a commissioner. Uh, for internal market, and he was Minister for Foreign Affairs in France some years ago. So the negotiation started. Uh, Davis is the chief negotiator uh, in the UK government. But there's a very, in my view, complicated issue. That is the fact that in the UK, the content of the negotiations are the first line of any daily newspaper, a TV program, and discussion. There is a 
big, huge, I think, natural attention to this topic. And all the political discussion in the UK is focused on the way in which Brexit negotiations are uh, taking place. That is not the case in the European Union, where the 27, we have so many crises to deal with. So uh, we, we gave to the negotiator the task to continue the negotiations and to deal uh, with, with, with the counterparts, but the judgment will be at the end of the process. That is not the case in the UK. And when you have such a differentiated attention with a big focus, all the political debate in the UK on these topics, that is not the case at the European level, that is creating an unbalanced situation that is uh, making complicated, I think, the, 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 the period and this negotiating uh, uh, process. The final point of the negotiations will be very complicated because of the timing. I think it will be necessary to have a phasing out for many, many fields. This phasing out will take, I think, for some of the most complicated issues, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe ten years. The crucial point is, as you know, the deal between free movement of capital and free movement of people. If I have to say, where is the beef? The beef is there. The deal between uh, the UK want to, that want to, 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 to keep the free movement of capital, uh, to, to keep London and to, to maintain the, the strength of London as financial capital uh, of Europe and one of, of the financial capital of the world, changing the rules of the free movement of people. That is, of course, unacceptable for the 27. So the big discussion will be on this issue. It is not easy. It will be really very complicated. I can't say now what will be the, uh, the outcome of this process. I don't think that uh, it is easy, easy. And I don't think that the outcome will be uh, for granted. You know the, the, the treaties are saying that if there's no agreement, there is the divorce and stop. But the problem here is not only the divorce. That is complicated, yes, I know. But the crucial point is how to reshape the relationship. Because it's, it's different from a normal divorce between people. Uh, because it is not just a divorce hello and another life. No, it's a, it's a divorce having a lot of uh, tasks together, mission together. Take the def defense and security issue. France and Great Britain are the two European countries in the Security Council of the UN. The role of uh, the UK on, on security and defense remain uh, decisive how to get a trade deal between Europe and the UK for the future. It is a big question mark. And it is part of this process. I repeat, the divorce is one part. But there is the how to reshape uh, the relationship. And the, the UK government decided not to follow the only uh, example, the only model that we have. <laughs> That is Norway, because Norway is a sort of uh, 29th European country, European Union country, without being a European Union member. But in Norway, you, are, you have the same rules of the European Union on almost all the fields. So Brexit will be, I think, a very complicated issue. We are all underestimating the technicalities of this very complicated negotiation. And I think, and this is why I was strongly against Brexit, if I may say, I think from abroad, the image will be an image of permanent instability of the European uh, rules. Because for years and years, we will continue with these negotiations. It will be complicated. But of course, uh, the UK voters decided democracy, and we have now to apply this decision. The second point, the migration crisis. 
very shortly, I have some slides, but I would like just to give you some overviews on uh, how and why this migration crisis was so complicated. The first point is the, exactly what we uh, had in, uh, in the year 2015. 2015 was the explosion of the crisis. Uh, you had, and we had, suddenly, uh, this race of uh, asylum seekers. Uh, half of them, one million, one million two hundred thousand, uh, half of them coming from three countries. That is interesting. And these three countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. So countries, outcome of crisis, of wars, wars in which the, West, the Western countries were, uh, were not spectators, were uh, involved. So the, the, the first point that is important to know is that uh, the outcome of this crisis, the Iraq crisis, Afghanistan, Syria, were very important for the, situa the internal situation of the European Union. That is, I think, important for an American audience because the, the link between the two subjects, Brexit and the migration crisis, is very easy. All the polls are saying that migrations were the first worry of the voters in the UK. And migration is a, is a very large meaning. In, with this meaning, you can say uh, many things. Uh, migrations means for, for, for the voters, in, uh, for, for the pro-Brexit voters, the presence of many Eastern European uh, workers in England. That was one of the worries. But the other main worries was linked to the images that uh, from the, the crisis in Calais, in Cologne, in Lampedusa, in Lesbos, the television was bringing to the uh, UK voters, saying, look, look this mess in the rest of Europe. And the idea to say, we want to get out from this mess, we don't want this mess, was a very important push, a very important boost for the result of Brexit. And it is very important to know that at the end of the day, uh, this refugee crisis was mostly linked on three countries of origin, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. And I think it is important to say that because you can easily understand why the Europeans are today, or some European leaders are so angry with Donald Trump today. Uh, Trump uh, saying that uh, the European Union is not able to manage the migration crisis, that is true, but the migration crisis is not because of the European Union. It's first of all because all these wars and because all this Western, very complicated dealing with the uh, Middle East, but the European Union paid the bill. This is what happened, first of all, with Brexit, and second, with the very complicated situation of the uh, migrant crisis. Here you have some numbers on the of, the, of the 15 crisis, uh, the countries, and, and the, the way and the routes. What was unbelievable, and for the first time we had such a situation, it was the fact that usually the route was the Mediterranean one, so through Libya to uh, Italy. In, thanks to the, to the digital revolution, the application of the, the new digital tools created the possibility for the smugglers to change in two weeks the routes. That was unpredictable unprecedented. This is why the big crisis of 15, you see here the big red uh, circle on the Balkans, it was exactly because this sudden change of the routes due to the application to the use of all the new tools. And that was uh, the, the big change because coming from the Balkans, they entered Germany. They entered uh, Austria, 
Hungary, Central Europe. And that created the biggest part of the crisis. Here you have uh, the other part of the problem linked to the Balkans. Because when the root of the migration crisis became the Balkan routes, you had not only the Syrians, Iraqi, Afghanistan people, but you had a lot of people coming from the Balkan countries, Kosovo, Albania, and other countries, trying to get the same route and try to get in the European Union. But of course, with a very different motivation. <clears throat> and the European Union had a big difficulty to stop them because you can't put them in the same box. The problem of the uh, Syrian refugees can't be treated as the will of Albanian people to get in the European Union. It is really different. Our rules are rules very generous for asylum seekers because of wars, but we can't be as generous as we are for asylum seekers for migrants for economic reasons. It is absolutely clear that on this second issue, there is a problem of quotas, selectivity, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, this, these figures are important just to show how sudden, unpredictable was the crisis in 15, with numbers that uh, the European Union never had before. And with this Germany, Hungary, and Austria uh, core of the crisis. Until now, uh, until 15, migration crisis was, first of all, Italy and Greece. Then, with the, Balkan, with the Balkan route, Germany, Hungary, and Austria, with this big, big clash between the old European uh, Union member states and the new, uh, the Visegrad countries, the uh, Central Eastern uh, European countries. Why? For a very, very easy reason. And, uh, and the reason is because of the way in which the different European countries are used to live with the immigration issue. In Germany, there are 8 million foreigners. In Italy, 5 million. In France, the same. In Hungary, in Poland, the number, the dimension of the number of foreigners living there in Poland, in Hungary, in Slovakia, the dimension is 100,000. So you have very homogeneous societies there in which the presence of a, one foreigner is something of completely unusual in comparison with what happens in uh, Italy or in Germany, in Spain, in France, in the other European member states. This is why this clash, this big clash between uh, East and West in Europe on the topic. And this clash is one of the most complicated issues. We had the agreement with Turkey. That was the only way that the Germans uh, pushed and, uh, and the, the way to, to, to try to stop this Balkan route. And this agreement uh, stopped uh, effectively the Balkan route and today, there's only one way that is, again, the Mediterranean route that is, uh, we say, unstoppable, because the sea is unstoppable. You can stop routes uh, through the land. It is very complicated to stop a uh, route by the sea. And that was, I think, the, uh, the, the most important, uh, and it is the most important pin point. Uh, my conclusion is that. Uh, on the migration crisis, the big problem is the fact that we, we, we were completely uh, overwhelmed by the dimension and the fact that the, the crisis came suddenly with a European Union uh, without any toolbox to, uh, to deal with the topic. You have to consider the fact that the toolbox was a toolbox 
if I may uh, use the comparison of the weather just for a very, a very low rain. But the problem was a storm. And when you don't have tools, rules, and the main problem is the uh, unbalance between geography in our European member states and the Dublin Treaty, that is the key point. The Dublin Treaty is the treaty saying that uh, the registration of the asylum seekers is responsibility of the first country, so Italy and Greece. But if you give all the responsibility in the hands of the first country, the entry country, Italy and Greece, with the borders that Italy and Greece have, the unbalance is so enormous. And you can't deal such a problem with, without a solidarity between countries. Look at Belgium, for instance. It is not so complicated to defend or to manage the border of Belgium. It's, it's a very easy border. The Greek border is a mess, but because of geography, not because of the goodwill or not goodwill. So the big problem is to now to rebalance uh, the, the, and to create a toolbox in Europe able to uh, separate asylum seekers, migrants for economic reasons, to relocate and to eliminate this idea of first entry, first big responsibility, and having a, a shared responsibility among the different uh, countries and different member states. It is not easy because there is a good solidarity between the old member states, but there is absolutely uh, a different approach from the countries that I mentioned before, countries not used to live with foreigners. So the big problem is today is this kind of separation, and it will be one of the uh, key issues for the future. My conclusion is about the sliding doors as I said before. These two main crises, Brexit, migration, will continue. That is the key point. It is not over. For the migration crisis, maybe it is over, I hope, for the three origin countries I mentioned, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, because we hope that these wars and we, these conflicts will be in the future less less, I would say, explosive in terms of uh, migrant. But if I give a look to the rest of the world, I know that there's, just, there's only one continent in the world that will double for sure, because demography is a, uh, we know always the forecast of demography, there's one continent that will for sure double his population. And this continent is Africa. This continent will have the double in 30 years, and this population will be a young population. Europe will lose population, and our population will be an aged, an aging society. So it is clear, if we don't succeed in creating development opportunities in Africa, the next decades will be decades in which African youth will try to find hope in Europe. This is why creating today uh, a toolbox, new rules, a possibility to manage structurally migration crisis is not only for Syrian problem, but is also for the future, because the migration will be one of the topic of the future. And I told about Brexit the same for the fact that for the next decade, I think this topic will continue and will be very complicated for the reasons and the consequences that I mentioned before. Sliding doors, why? Because the French elections and the German elections this year will have a global, uh, in the world, France and German elections will be uh, seen, followed, as Brexit and Trump last year. So is a sort of way to, to see if France and Germany will be the continuity of the sequence after Brexit and Trump, 
or the reaction. And that is the key point. And the French elections, because of the electoral rule, that is a, pre a presidential one, not a parliamentary one. Presidential one means the, the night of the 7th of May, you know if it is sun or moon. There is no nuances. Uh, it's like, like uh, Clinton Trump, no nuances. One wins and the other one loses. And it is because of the presence of Marine Le Pen there, so a candidate probably at the second round, because she will be probably first or second. Uh, and she is, she is bringing the idea of the, uh, of the end of the European Union as it is today. So for Europe and for the world, 7th of May, the evening, will be decisive to know the future. If Marine Le Pen, so the future of Europe will be a future of nations, not of European integration within the European Union. If it is Macron, is the, today the, the other one in the polls, Macron is the first French leader that I uh, heard or watched having the European flag uh, behind him. I say leader, I don't say official uh, minister or president. Uh, uh, an electoral campaign with the European flag behind him is something of very courageous and very brave. And frankly speaking, I, you can imagine that I uh, hope, strongly hope, that Macron will, uh, will win in France. That will be a big push for a different mood of the European integration. And the same for Germany uh, in September. So these two moments will be decisive for the future of the European integration, for, uh, for the world, for politics in the world, in the Western world. It is, as uh, I repeat, a sort of European sliding doors, the way to say, after Brexit, Trump the sequence continues, or after Brexit and Trump, there is an interruption and a completely different mood from the uh, European uh, uh, Union member states. This is why I think this uh, discussion today uh, is arriving in a very, very interesting timing. And this is why it's so interesting for me to share with you these views and also to listen your point of views on these very important matters. Thank you.